Welcome to our ongoing series of classes on Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Noyach. Uh, we are currently studying from the Encyclopedia Talmudis, the, Halach, the Talmudical Encyclopedia, Chelek Krach He, Volume 5, and the entry is Goy, and the um, topic is actually quite thorough and lengthy. We are towards the end. So we are on page, or better yet, column, Shin Samech Aleph, which would be number 361. Um, second paragraph towards the very top of the page, on column... 361. And right now, we are in the midst of discussing various different relationships in business um, between the Jew and the non Jew. <clears throat> you see, um, when it comes to financial matters or um, any type of business interaction between one Jew and another Jew, so the Torah is quite clear. And the question is, when do we extend those rules for an interaction between a Jew and a non-Jew? We're not talking about between one non-Jew and another non-Jew, which we've discussed that a while ago, um, whether all the rules that all the civil laws that we find in the Torah, primarily in the book of Shmois, Exodus, in the weekly portion of Mishpatim. So most of it are civil laws. And the question is, ideally, should the non-Jews, the nations of the world, should they adopt those exact laws? Or are those laws specific for the Jewish people? And the non-Jews should make up their own um, laws, and they can therefore vary, and they can change from time to time, from location to location, from country to country, depending on all the various different conditions. So those are two different approaches. Uh, but right now we're discussing the civil laws or monetary laws or interaction between Jew and non-Jew. So certain times the verse will use an expression such as reyacha, meaning that the Torah is speaking to the Jew about his fellow Jew, Re'acha, your fellow Jew. And that would seem to exclude the Goy, the non-Jew. However, at times, we would include the non-Jew. And then, of course, in certain cases, it's disputed, and we have an argument. And then the question is, so what would be the halacha, what would be the final legal ruling. All right, so after that brief introduction, uh, let us begin. There is an argument, there is a dispute between the Mishnaic sages. Does a Jew acquire ownership, even if it's temporary, but actually acquire ownership of security or of collateral for a loan of a non-Jew, in the same fashion that a Jew acquires this collateral or security for a loan from another Jew. And the discussion really goes to the tractate of Pesachim, which deals with the laws of Passover. And as you all probably know, and if not, I'll tell to you now briefly. When it comes to Passover, to the festival of Pesach, it is absolutely, totally, 100% forbidden for any Jew to eat, to own, or to benefit from something which is referred to in the Torah 
the term in the holy language in Lashon HaKodesh is Chametz. Ches Mem Tzadik. Chametz. Which basically, without going into all the details, to basically define it, um, one of the five grains, wheat, barley, etc., which are ground into a flour and come in contact with water and have a chance to rise or become chametz. That is an absolute serious prohibition, as I mentioned, for a Jew to eat or own or benefit. And therefore, it's not spring cleaning. Nothing can compare to how the Jewish people are supposed to clean their homes, not only their kitchens, but anywhere that there's a chance that a speck or a crumb of anything like this, bread, cake, cookie, pastries, anything of that nature may have come there somehow. We're supposed to really, really clean. And then we do a checking the night before Passover. And we really turn over the entire kitchen. Um, some people for convenience and to be more careful actually have a separate kitchen. So they just close off their year-round kitchen. And what yearly, throughout the entire year, is considered for a Jew 100% kosher for Passover would be considered 100% non-kosher. Okay, nothing to do with what type of meat you get and the separation of meat and milk. This is a completely different level we're coming to. All right. Having said that, um, a Jew can't own chametz. So the Jew has to get rid of it. He eats it up. And when it comes to the day before Passover in the morning, has to burn whatever is left. It's not enough to just put it away. has to burn it completely till it becomes non-existent as chametz and it's just ashes. Or, in addition to that, a Jew, what's practically done nowadays, at least for the past several centuries, he sells it to a non-Jew. And that's legal. I'm not going to go into all the details of how it's done. And it doesn't have to be taken out of the Jew's possession because legally the areas in which he has the chametz in his house are actually either leased or rented to the non-Jew. So the chametz is absolutely sold to the non-Jew without any strings attached. It's an absolute sale. And the area in the house, the cabinets or wherever he's storing the chametz, that room or those cabinets or storage places are actually, as I said, either leased or rented to the non-Jew. And then after Passover, um, the Jew buys it back from the non-Jew. Very, very detailed, extremely complicated, and therefore no layman, no Jewish layman should do this on his own. And instead, he goes to someone, to a rabbi, to a um, rabbi. It's not, it's not really enough to just you know, be ordained as a rabbi, but to someone who's actually proficient in these laws. And he gives him the power of attorney. He appoints the rabbi to be his agent, to do whatever the rabbi sees fit, in whatever fashion he sees fit, to all the chametz that the Jew owns. So you have the whole community comes to their rabbi and... Um, signs a document, etc., etc., and then the rabbi meets up with the non-Jew um, on the morning before the day Passover begins, and they go through this whole legal transaction. <clears throat> All right. Now, um, how about if a Jew 
lent money to an Anju. That's fine. And in order to make sure that he gets paid back, the Nanju gave him collateral to hold on to. And the collateral was not um, a bar of gold, was not a silver goblet, was not a cloak, but rather chametz. So the Jew has in his possession chametz. Now, if the chametz belongs to the non-Jew, technically, illegally, that's okay. It's not my chametz. Just like I have a lot of chametz in my house that is being sold to, the, to this non-Jew. I sold him my chametz. It's in my house, but it's not mine. <coughs> well, how about the guy that I sold my chametz to? That's one person. But then there's a different guy. Nothing to do with that transaction or that sale. I have a different guy that I lent money to. And he gave me, <clears throat> as security, chametz to hold on to. He gave me a bottle of expensive vodka, which is absolutely chametz. It's made out of wheat. So now... What's the story? Do I own it or am I just holding on to it because he's got my money for the next month or two or whatever the deal was and then I'll give it back to him. So I'm holding on to his chametz. Or do we say no? When it, Now again, let's backtrack for a moment. Let's put aside Passover and let's put aside the non-Jew just for the sake of clarification. Between two Jews... One Jew lends money to another Jew. The borrower is giving collateral to the lender. During the time that the lender has the collateral, while the money is still on loan, during that period of time, all opinions agree that the lender actually owns that collateral. It's temporary, but he's the owner. And what that means, practically speaking, is he's not just a shoymer. He's not just a guard who's watching someone else's property. But rather, it's, he takes full responsibility. He's much more liable than a person who is merely guarding someone else's property. Sometimes a person can be watching someone else's property for no payment. That's one level. Or he could be paid to watch someone else's property. Then he has more liability. In this case, it's beyond any of that. Because he now owns it for this period of time. So that's clear. And then when the um, borrower pays up the, the entire debt, so then the lender must return the collateral. And then he no longer is the owner, of course. Then it transfers ownership back to the original owner, which was the borrower. So that's clear. The question is, when you have such a situation, such a relationship between a lender and a borrower with the collateral, and the lender is a Jew and the borrower is a non-Jew. So that's what we're going to discuss now. So there's actually a dispute between Tanoim as to whether the Jew acquires and gets this temporary ownership in the collateral that the non-Jew gave him, like it would be the case if it was a Jew. Rabbi Meir Soiver, Kalvachoymer, Rabbi Meir, he holds that we use the logic called a Kalvachoymer, meaning, Shal Yisrael koine, shal goy kal shukein. If, when it comes to a Jew if the borrower was a Jew, and yet we say then that it's clear and everybody agrees that the lender becomes the owner, he actually acquires the collateral, how much more so if it's an Anjou? Then certainly the Jew, the lender, becomes the owner. However, the majority of the sages who disagree with Rameir, they hold... 
Shabal Choiv Koine Mashkoin. Since everything that we learned about from the Torah, that the lender acquires temporary ownership of this collateral, how do we get that? How do we know that he becomes an owner? Where do we derive that from? It's all derived from the words used in the verse that speaks about giving back the collateral while while the borrower still has the money. Because the verse says, And for you, it shall be considered a charitable act. And the Talmud explains what do those three words mean? What do we see from those three words? If he didn't acquire this collateral, if it didn't become his, so what kind of act of charity is that? In other words, like this. Let's say that the collateral was a tool that the fellow has to use for his business. This is a tool that he uses um, for his livelihood. And he says, look, I got to borrow $1,000 and I will lend you my drill. Not lend you, excuse me. I want to borrow $1,000 and I will give you as collateral my drill. Okay? And the guy needs to use his drill every day for about 12 hours, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So what the Jew needs to do, the lender, he's got to give the borrower every single morning that drill and then the borrower is obligated to return it to the lender every single evening. So it goes back and forth. So basically 12 hours, it's serving a purpose of security in the possession of the lender. He can't use it, but he's holding on to this because the guy's got his money. And every single day, the lender has to, he didn't get his money back. He has to return this security to the borrower who needs it, uses it, gives it back, and it goes back and forth. That act of giving back for when he needs it, like in this example that I gave, this tool that he needs during the day, that act, the verse says, when you do that, that's charity. So the Talmud says, why is that charity if you have to give it to him? From there we derive, it must be that he's actually the owner. And therefore, if I let someone use something which I own, that's called a charitable act. But if I let someone use what's rightfully theirs, that's like the letter of the law. That's not an act of charity. If I give someone permission to go use their own tools, what's charity about that? So from the fact that the verse says, and for you it shall be charity, we learn out from there that he actually owns it temporarily. So therefore, the Chachamim say, well, that verse is clearly written for a Jew. And that's why the Chachamim maintain that it only applies with a borrower and a lender if the borrower is a Jew. Because that verse, where we derive this whole thing from, that he becomes the temporary owner, is talking about an interaction between two Jews. Which means that if the borrower... And if the real original owner of the collateral is not Jewish, then it doesn't apply, and the Jew does not become the temporary owner. He's just holding on to someone else's property as security. All right, two opinions. Lahalacha, so what's the final position um, legally? What is our ruling? Nechlekuri shaynim. There's an argument between the codifiers, the ones that come after the Talmud. Some rule like Reb Meir, which means that it does belong to the Jew, just as if the borrower would have been a Jew. No difference if the borrower is a Goy. Still, the Jewish lender acquires temporary ownership of this collateral. And others say, no, they follow the Chachamim, which maintain 
that the Jew does not acquire ownership if the borrower is a non-Jew. The guy, However, everyone agrees that if it were to be the reverse, if the borrower of the money is a Jew and the lender is a non-Jew and the Jewish borrower gave collateral to the non-Jewish lender, then everyone agrees that in that case the lender does not acquire temporary ownership of the collateral. Even um, Reb Meir would agree with that. Mashkoinai shel Yisrael. All right, now what happens if you have a collateral of a Jew? Shaya biyad goy, that was in the hands of a goy, meaning, let's say, the non-Jew lent money to the Jew, and the Jew gave him collateral. And we said in that case, everybody agrees that he didn't, the non-Jew does not acquire ownership of that. And then he lost it, or temporarily lost it. He dropped it. Vinaf al menu. It fell from him. Umitsa Yisrael. And a third party who is Jewish found it. So again, Mr. Goy lent a thousand dollars to Mr. Jew. Mr. Jew gave, just to stick to the same example, his drill, the Jew, the Jew is a carpenter or whatever. So he gave his drill to the guy. The guy misplaced it, lost it, and a Jew found it. Second Jew, third person, found it. Chayev la shiva li Yisrael. So he has a mitzvah and he's obligated, he is required to return this to the Jew, that's the original owner, to the borrower. Because since the non-Jew who had it in his possession as collateral only had it as such, as security that he's going to get his money back, but he didn't acquire ownership of this item. Therefore, so when he lost it, and a Jew found it, so now his obligation falls away. And therefore, you don't return it to the fellow who lost it, you return it to the rightful owner. Unlike if, let's say, it was, let's say all three parties are Jewish. So one Jew lent money to another Jew, and the borrower gave collateral to the lender, and the lender lost it, and another Jew found it. Who does he give it back to? He knows that the original owner is this borrower, but he knows that he owes him money, and this really is in the possession of the lender, who should he give it to? He should absolutely give it to the lender, because it is currently, temporarily, the lender's. But in this case, since the lender is a non-Jew, and he doesn't own that collateral, even temporarily, it's only what we call shibud, therefore he gives it to the Jew. What happens if the finder, the Jewish finder, would like to return it to the non-Jew in order to cause a sanctification of God's name? Okay. Which goes back to the whole idea of returning a lost item. There's a mitzvah that if a Jew finds an item that, a non, that, that another Jew lost, there is a mitzvah, there is an obligation, a commandment, for the finder, the Jew found it, to return it to the one who lost it. How about if a Jew finds a lost article of a non-Jew? So in general, and I'm generalizing, in general, there is no mitzvah to return it to the one who lost it. And we can actually apply then the if you will, the childish um, expression that finders keepers, losers, weepers. That does not apply between one Jew and another Jew. But if a Jew found something which 
he knows or can assume belongs to a non-Jew who lost it, so he doesn't have to return it. The guy lost it. He found it. However, if he wants to make a sanctification of God's name by returning it, then by all means, he should return it because then the one who lost it is going to be very appreciative, very thankful, and he says, wow, look at this Jew. He returned something to me. Most people probably wouldn't have done it. It's not stealing. I lost it. It's gone. So whatever the legalities are in the secular law, again, you know, a lot of details. If it has the guy's name on it and it says, if found, please return, that may be something else. But we're not talking about that. The guy found it and he knows who the owner is, but the guy lost it. So here, because the Jew is returning it, that's one of the actions that will cause the average human being, the average non-Jew, to think highly of the Jewish people, of Jewish law, and ultimately of God. So it's a sanctification of God's name. So what about in this case? If he wants to return it not to the Jewish owner who's the borrower, but he wants to return it to the um, non-Jew who's the lender who lost mm-hmm. it. Hashem Interesting rule. Now, you want to make a Kiddush Hashem? Use your own property. You can't use someone else's property. One Jew can't use another Jew's property to sanctify God's name. You want to make a Kiddush Hashem, let it come out of your pocket. Very interesting. So the Jew's not allowed to return that exact drill to the non-Jew who lost it. You have to return it to the rightful owner, which is your fellow Jew, the borrower. I want to make a Kiddush Hashem, take the value of that um, drill. It doesn't have to be $1,000. It could be much more, it could be much less. It's just a matter of holding on to something so that he can pay back the loan. Go to him, and you could tell him, look, you lost the um, collateral. I found it. I gave it back to the owner. But because that drill was actually worth $500, I'm going to give you now $500 to hold on to until he finishes paying you your debt, the debt that he owes you of $1,000, and then they give me back the money. That could be a Kiddush Hashem. But you, the Jew doesn't have a right to return the tool to the non-Jew who lost it because it's not the non-Jews. Yes, Now there are some that say sheaf b'mois that even in the actual money shehilva Yisrael legoy that a Jew lent a non-Jew. So let's say the lender is a Jew, and the borrower is a non-Jew. And now the non-Jew actually lost the very money, the coins themselves, al Hamashkoin, and he gave him collateral. And the non-Jew lost the money. Not, not that the lender lost the collateral. The borrower, who's the non-Jew, lost the money. Kachadin. So some say the same rule applies. You can't return that money to the non-Jew who borrowed it. It's not his money. He just borrowed it. So you have to return it to the Jewish lender. And some say, no, 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 that's different. Because when it comes to money, the whole point of borrowing money is to spend. It's not the same as borrowing an item. When you borrow a tool, so your intention is to use that tool and to return the very same tool. When you borrow money from someone, there's absolutely no necessity on any level to return the very same coins or bills or whatever it is. The whole point of borrowing money is to spend. So you don't have to try to give them back the money. That's not what you're doing. You're borrowing money. And therefore, as soon as the lender, the Jewish lender, lent the money to the non-Jewish borrower, he has permanently separated himself from those very coins. He lent him $1,000. The guy's going to pay him back $1,000 with different bills. And therefore, 
Vehem shel ha So the one who found them, they belong to him. And therefore you don't give it back to the lender. Either you keep it, if that's the rule, or give it back to the non-Jew. Okay. Next. Next paragraph. Towards the bottom of Shin Samech Aleph 361. In many cases, a Jew would be obligated to take an oath for property or money that he may have and if someone has a claim against him. So many times, um, the Jew would be obligated to take an oath in the Jewish court in the base It doesn't apply at all. If it's the non-Jews' property or money that we're dealing with. Because the non-Jews are not included in the category of re'ehu, which means his fellow Jew. And when it comes to the cases where a person is obligated to take an oath, it clearly states re'ehu, that this is um, a dispute between a Jew and his fellow Jew. And likewise, a non-Jew would not take an oath, or at least not a biblical oath, for a claim that a Jew has against him. So the whole idea of taking an oath in all of those cases only applies between one Jew and another Jew. The classical case now that the Torah speaks about, and again, in the portion of Mishpatim, in the book of Shmois of Exodus, one of the classical cases of someone's property damaging someone else's property is if an axe does damage, an axe gores. So there's a concept called an axe which is a tum or an axe which is a muad. Tum means it was first or second offense. And interestingly enough, the owner only has to pay 50% of the damages. An axe, which is a muad, which means that he's already accustomed to doing damages, and in those cases, the owner already has to pay from then on for that axe 100%. Okay? So, Shar Shal Yisrael, an axe that's owned by a Jew. This is the damaging, this is the damager ox, owned by Jew. Shinagach Shor Shal Goy, that gored an ox owned by a non Jew. So again, if it would be a, an ox owned by a Jew that gored an ox owned by a Jew, Torah is very clear about that. But here the case is different. An ox owned by a Jew damaged, gored an ox owned by a non Jew. Potter Milashalem, the owner, the Jewish owner, is exempt from payment. Even if the axe that did the damaging was a muad, meaning the one that's already done damage and is known to be a damaging axe, which normally the person would have to pay 100% of the damages. Here, he's exempt. Vishor shall goy. And how about if you have an axe that's owned by a non Jew, the reverse case? Shinogach Shor Shal Yisrael, that gored an axe owned by a Jew. Bein tam, bein muad, mishal nezak shalim. So here we say whether the axe of the non Jew, the damager, whether he's a tam or a muad, is irrelevant, and he always has to pay 100%. Shnei limudim nemer badavar. All right, we have over here two sources from the verses to teach us this rule that if the damaging ox is owned by a Jew and the damagee is owned by a non-Jew, it doesn't have to pay. If it's the reverse, it has to pay 100%. Because the one verse says, that if the ox of a person, of a man, will damage the axe of, and again the word, re'ehu. 
his fellow Jew. From that we learn out, and this whole rule doesn't apply if the ox that got damaged belongs to a non-Jew. The oid, and furthermore, shenemar, because the verse states, and this actually becomes a very general and basic verse, and it's a verse which is in the book of Chavakuk. Chapter 3, verse 6. Please. Thank you. In the book of Chavakuk, we find the following statement. Omad, he stood, Vayemoided Eretz, and he measured out the land. Ra, he saw, Vayater Goyim. So, in one translation here, they are trans- translating it literally as and dispersed nations. Now, on that, based on that verse, the Talmud teaches us, Ra'a sheva mitzvois shnitztavu ben b'nei noyach v'loi kimun. What does it mean, Ra'a? We're talking about God. So Ra'a he saw, and then Vayater Goyim, he permitted or he untied or undid the nations of the world. God saw the seven Noahide commandments that he had commanded all of mankind, that they're not keeping them. Ahmad, so going back to the verse, as it were, God got up, and therefore, sort of as a penalty, if you will, he undid, he allowed their property for the Jew. Meaning, it seems unfair, and that's exactly what we're saying. It, that's right. We're, so to, it's, we're, the rule is seemingly unfair as sort of a penalty or a punishment, because they're not keeping the seven laws. Therefore, God said, you know what? When it comes to um, relationship between a Jew and a non-Jew, if the dam in these cases, if the damager, I guess you'd call him the aggressor, is a Jew, and the one who suffered a financial loss, the one who's acts was killed, is a non-Jew, the Jew doesn't have to make a payment. He's exempt. Now that does not mean that that a Jew is allowed to purposely damage someone else's property. Of course not. It's an ox that gored another ox. Ah, but because the ox that did the damaging is owned by a Jew, and the ox that got damaged is not owned by a Jew, so we don't look into half payment, 50%. We don't look into full payment. There's no payment. So we have two verses. One from the book of Exodus that says Re'ehu, and the second one from the book of Chavakuk. Now, we are in the second line of Shin Samach Beis, 362. Now we have an argument between the early codifiers, post-Talmud. Some say, that from the first verse that we quoted from the Chumash, from the book of Exodus, where it says, his fellow Jew, 
Lemeidim, we learn out. Liftor, to exempt. Shor, shall Yisrael, shnogach l'shor, shall goy. That if an axe owned by a Jew, gored, damaged, the axe owned by a non-Jew, the rules don't apply because it says re'ehu. V'hoyalonu liftor milimud zeh, but based on that verse solely, independently that verse, we should have also learned out from there to exempt afshar shal goyish yisrael. The reverse case as well. That if a non-Jew's ox damaged a Jew's ox, he should also be totally exempt. In other words, the word re'ehu teaches me that it's only interaction between two Jews. doesn't matter who the, da- who the damager and who the damagee is. As long as one of the two parties involved is non-Jewish, the rules don't apply. And therefore, the Jew doesn't have to pay the non-Jew. And the same thing in the reverse. The non-Jew would not need to pay the Jew either. That's if we only had the verse re'ehu. Ella. It's just that, again, because of the second verse that we have, so the Torah is making their money, their property, in this case, ownerless, and says, nope, that they are obligated to pay. Because of this penalty that they didn't keep the seven laws on an international level, Therefore, it's only we only apply the verse l'reihu if it's for the benefit financially of the Jew. But if it would be for the benefit of the non-Jew, meaning it was the ox of a Jew that gored the ox of a non-Jew, so I'm sorry, if it would be that the ox of a non-Jew gored the ox of the Jew, then we say they do have to pay. The non-Jew has to pay for the damage, not because of l'reihu, despite the word l'reihu because of this verse in Habakkuk. That's one opinion. That's one approach. The Yeshua Imrim, and the other opinion that disagrees, some say, that actually, both rules, that if the Jew is the one whose ox did the damaging, that he doesn't have to pay, and if the one who did the damaging is the ox of the non-Jew, that he does have to pay. Both of those rules, which both benefit the Jew, we learn out from the Chavakuk, where basically the, the implication of the verse is that it's a penalty for the non-Jewish people. So penalty means that it's lose-lose situation. If you were damaged by the Jew, by his property, by his ox, no payment. If you damaged the Jew's property, then you have to pay. Because really, by the logic of the letter of the law, if the ox owned by a Jew damaged the ox owned by the non-Jew, the Jew should have paid. Logically, whoever did the damage should pay. So if a guy damaged a Jew, yes payment. And if a Jew damaged a guy, yes payment. And they say because the, um, the first verse that we said from the word L'Re'ehu, they play it down and they say it's not necessarily to be taken to include only the Jew and to exclude the non-Jew. So that's a second approach, that we learn the whole thing out from the Chavakuk one. And then we have yet a third opinion of how we get to this conclusion that the Jew doesn't have to pay and the non-Jew does. The yesh, shalomdu, and then there are those that learned shnei adinim, both of these rules that the Jew doesn't have to pay and the non-Jew does. Minakosov shal re'ehu. They learn them both out from the verse of re'ehu. Shekei Nehmar, for the verse states as follows, that if the axe of a man will damage 
the acts of his fellow Jew. Vidarshu, and based on the wording in that verse, the sages derived, Shor Ish, the verse says, acts of man. To include the acts of others. Who's that? Hainu Goyim. That's non Jews. Shame Bichlal Ish, they're included. The word the Torah uses the word Ish. Generally speaking, it doesn't use that. It just speaks directly in second person. And it just says the rule. It says the word Ish. Sometimes, usually not. In this case, why sing the word Ish? To include anybody who's an Ish, and that's every human being. So the verse, by using the word Ish, seems to imply that if the acts of anybody, so once you're speaking to anybody, who would be Re'ehu? That would be anybody. Es Shor Re'ehu, but then because it says the acts of Re'ehu, which is in fact an expression, biblically speaking, reserved for fellow Jew, so that's coming to exclude if the acts of a non-Jew did, did, did the uh, damages. The Yesh Soivrim, and then you have a fourth opinion, and they explain it as follows. Here's the logic. What's the reason that if the acts of a Jew gores, damages, kills, the acts of a non-Jew that the Jew is exempt from payment? Because we will judge according to the non-Jewish secular law. And that's their rules. Because generally speaking, in the non-Jewish world, the court of law will not obligate someone to pay for damages that his animal did. What am I supposed to do? I didn't send it to go do damages. I did my best. The ox was in the marketplace. My ox was plowing my field. And he ran off and he did damage. What am I supposed to do? I couldn't just go shoot him. I didn't have that option. I own an ox. I wasn't negligent. So therefore, since if in the non-Jewish world, if an ox of a non-Jew gores his fellow non-Jew's ox, they would not make him pay. So we say, okay, so we're following your rules. And likewise, Shor shall Yisrael shay misses a goy. How about if the axe of a Jew didn't kill the axe of a non-Jew, but actually killed the non-Jew, killed a human being? The axe owned by a Jew killed a non-Jewish human being. Potter, the Jew, the owner of the axe, is also exempt. Why? Shekenu bidinayim, because that's the same rule that they have. If a non-Jew's ox were to kill a fellow non-Jew, they would exempt the owner of the perpetrator. So therefore we say, no difference. If the ox is owned by a Jew, then the Jew is also exempt. And how about the reverse? V'shor shal goy shenokach l'shor shal Yisrael. And the ox owned by a non-Jew that gores the ox of a Jew. So why over there do we say that we make the non-Jew always pay full payment? I thought we're going according to the non-Jewish law. In other words, we're saying all these rules of 50% payment and then 100% payment, if someone's ox scores someone else's ox, that's only between two Jews. All right. So then let's take it all the way then. So if it's interaction between a Jew and a non-Jew, what's the difference who the damager is and who the damagee is? It should always be totally exempt if you're following the non-Jewish law. So why is it that if the non-Jew's ox gores the Jew's ox, all of a sudden we say he has to pay 100%? Why? If you're going to go according to the non-Jewish law, 
So they should be exempt. Knasu zelohem. This is a fine. It's a penalty. It's not according to, so to say, the letter of the law. It's not, well, you caused this person this financial loss. No, because according to the secular rules, if someone's animal did damage, he doesn't have to pay. So why are we giving them, why are we penalizing these goyim? Because as a general rule, they're not careful in keeping the commandments, and therefore they do not remove dangerous situations as they should. And they're not taking the proper precautions of protecting society from their oxen in this case. And therefore, as a penalty, we say, your ox damaged, even though if it would be between two non-Jews, your rules are that you're exempt. That's very nice. But if you damage the Jews' property, so as a penalty, we're going to make you pay. And if you're not going to make them pay for the damages, so they're not going to properly watch their animals, and they're going to end up causing people to lose money. Okay, now, the next piece is very important. Everything that we spoke about until now, in this case, between Jew and non-Jew, as far as, you know, the ox damaging, we continue and we say as follows. The Chosfor Rishonim, again, early codifiers, have written as follows. Shaloinem ru advarim, that the above mentioned, that if the Jew damages the non-Jew, his ox damages his ox, no payment. But vice versa, yes, payment, 100% payment in all cases. Though that, that rule was only said, was Musim, only when it comes to nations that in fact are not safeguarding and are not careful with laws and with proper manners. Like we quoted the statement before from the Talmud based on the verse in Chavakuk. Hashem saw, God saw, that they're not keeping the seven laws. Therefore, he said that their property is free. Their property is not to be theirs. So that clearly implies, ha, kol sheva mitzvis biyadam, so any nation that does keep the seven laws, that they don't fall into this general, inappropriate, abandoning of the commandments. But if you have nations that are adhering to the seven laws, so then we would judge them according to our laws. Because why not? And therefore we do not show favoritism towards ours. We don't say, let's be unfair for the Jewish benefit. And if the Jew is the damager, no payment. But if the non-Jew is the damager, yes payment. That's not fair and let's not do that. That's what some say. It's only as a penalty because they're not keeping the seven mitzvahs. But as long as they're keeping the seven, so then we have to deal with them according to our laws and be fair. And therefore goes without saying that those that are careful, so you basically have like three categories. One category is the extreme that they are clearly not keeping, they're rejecting the fulfillment of the seven. Then you have the middle, that they're not rejecting the seven. Then you have the other extreme, that they are clearly careful to keep laws and to safeguard, etc. And yet, another opinion. Then you have amongst the early codifiers that write as follows. 
that this statement that we said based on the verse in Chavakuk that God said that it's their their money is free. Only about the original seven nations that were um, inhabiting the land of Eretz Yisrael of Israel. Shaf nafsham hefker, because even their very lives are open. So we're talking about the Kanani. Those seven nations are where we say that these rules apply because they're totally <coughs> corrupt and even their lives are not to be spared. Next, Shor Shal Goy, Shinokach Shor Shal Goy. What about that case? A non Jew's ox gores, kills his fellow non Jew's ox. What about that case? Chai of Loilon as Sholem. In that case, he always has to pay full damages. Meaning, there's no such thing as 50%. That's a special rule that applies between one Jew and another Jew. But between one guy and another guy, if his ox damaged, always pays full damage. Even if the non-Jew took upon himself to follow the Jewish ruling, the Jewish law, and they're coming to the Basin, two non-Jews, they say, we want to follow the Jewish rules. And here's the case. There's witnesses that Goy A has an ox that killed Goy B's ox. The base, and it's the first offense. The Jewish law, the rabbis would decree that Goy A must pay 100% of the damages. All right. Um, next, al mitzvahs priko te'ina im yeshna bebehema shel goy, ayin oit priko te'ina. And there's a specific mitzvah, two mitzvahs, two commandments. One is called prika, and that is to help your fellow unload his animal's load. The animal is um, crouched under a very heavy load, and the load is so heavy that the owner cannot get the load off of this poor animal who's stuck under the load. So there is a mitzvah that a Jew must help his fellow Jew unload the animal. And then there is, so to say, the opposite mitzvah. And that is to load the animal. In other words, there's a heavy load and the Jew cannot seem to pick it up and get it onto the donkey or onto the camel or whatever, onto his back. So there's a mitzvah that the Jew must help his fellow Jew put that load onto the animal. Do those two mitzvahs apply when it's a non-Jew. So he says, for that, you need to look into the volume of the encyclopedia here that um, the entry is Prika and Te'ina. And next, Al Goy Adosh Beparasa Shel Yisrael. Vi Yisrael Adosh Beparasa Shel Goy. Benigel Yisrael Shel Loisach Soim Ayenoit Chasima. Then we have another mitzvah. And this is a negative one, a uh, prohibition. While a Jew is working with an animal in a field. There's a prohibition to muzzle that animal. You have to allow the animal to eat from what it's doing. So if the animal is in a field and whatever is growing in that field, you're not allowed to muzzle that animal with the intention that you don't want him to eat from what is in the field. You must allow the animal to eat from what it's working with. Okay, that's if a Jew is working in the field with an animal that either he owns or a fellow Jew owns. What about if the Jew is working in a field, but the animal that he's using actually belongs to a non-Jew? He's borrowing or renting the animal from a non-Jew. Or vice versa. The one who's working in the field, or the owner of the field, is a non-Jew. 
But he's using the animal that belongs to a Jew. He's borrowing or renting an animal of a Jew. So in either of those two cases, does this prohibition apply or not? So he says, for that you need to look up in the encyclopedia, in the entry of chasima, of this mitzvah of muzzling. All right, we have two more subsections left in this entry of Goy. <clears throat> the two final ones. One of them is Tivoy, which means his nature. So now we are going to define how the Torah looks at the nature of your typical average non-Jew. What is his nature as far as Jewish law is concerned, as far as the interaction or the relationship or the view that a Jew should have on his fellow human being that's not Jewish? <clears throat> and again, that does not mean that there aren't exceptions. It doesn't mean that there aren't many exceptions. It does mean that there are people that are on a much higher level. But we're now going to speak about, we're going to stereotype, we're going to generalize your typical goy. Hagoy neicholoy befkerus shelzima. A non-Jew once he is comfortable or what he really wants is freedom when it would come to promiscuity. And even according to the opinion in the Talmud that maintains that maintains that a non-Jewish servant does not want this type of freedom, as it were. That's because he would like to free himself from being in a state of a slave. But a guy who's not a slave, everybody agrees that he would like this freedom of being able to do what he wants. But again, this is specifically only to an adult who grew up with this um, characteristic of, of freedom. Shetoam tamisur, meaning he tasted the taste of sin, of something prohibited. Once he has that taste, so therefore, that, so to say, whets his appetite. We don't want to apply that to a, a minor. So we're having more of a condescending attitude towards an adult who has experienced um, transgression, but the child not. Cruelty. To have that nature of being cruel is only found amongst the non-Jewish nations. Shnemar, for the verse states in Jeremiah, Cruel they are and they will not have mercy or pity. And therefore, Anybody, including a Jew, who is cruel and doesn't have mercy or pity on people, we need to be concerned with his proper uh, genealogy, with his lineage. Is he really Jewish? We're not disqualifying him, but we are putting into doubt his Jewishness. We think he's Jewish. We know his parents. We know his grandparents. And as far back as we can go, seems Jewish. Maybe his great, 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 great grandmother was not Jewish. Maybe 
she converted not properly. Why? Because he is cruel and he doesn't have mercy on people. And we say that a Jew can't be like that. Not just that it's forbidden. It's not his nature. And therefore, actually, when it would come for a Jew, for example, to marry, and he sees a family that has this streak of cruelty, Again, we don't mean someone who's moody. We don't mean someone who has a temper. We don't mean someone who gets angry. Those are inappropriate characteristic traits that Jew and non-Jew alike can have. We're talking about being cruel. That's a harsh word. And lacking compassion or mercy or pity. That, by nature, Jew can't have. A guy can. And therefore... If a Jew sees a Jewish family that has that, big problem, and stay away. As an individual, without excommunicating them, without disqualifying their Jewishness, but every individual Jew should say, that family is not for me to marry into. The cause for Rishonim and the early codifiers wrote, Shemipnei tivam shel goyim, that because of this nature of the non-Jews, that they are lacking the three natural signs, if you will, that every Jew has, the Talmud says that by nature, not by nurture, and not because of spiritual things, but by nature... Jews have these three characteristic traits. They are merciful. They are a certain type of bashfulness or shyness, if you will. And they are kind. Because Goyim are lacking those, therefore, Chalav Shel Goya, the milk of a non-Jewish woman, will actually nurture and it will bring about a bad nature in the infant. And for that reason, this is another practical uh, halacha, for that very reason, if you want to um, go beyond the letter of the law, it's not legally forbidden, but it is not the a pious trait. Not to allow a Jewish infant, a Jewish child, to nurse from, to have a wet nurse who is not Jewish. Because since she's not Jewish, her milk is kosher for an infant to nurse from her. But because she's not Jewish, by him nursing from her milk, that will give him that type of a, of, a, of a nature. And therefore, it's appropriate for a Jew to go beyond the letter of the law and not, if possible, to avoid having the Jewish infant's nurse from a non-Jewish woman. Next. Non-Jews are not modest as Jews are. And as a rule, they do not modestly hide their um, stains of the menstrual period. They're not as careful. And because of that, again, a practical application in, in Jewish law, therefore, these types of stains which um, come or are found amongst the non-Jews are in fact pure. Even if there are also Jewish women or girls there. Why? See, the rule is that 
this blood stain of a woman who has her menstrual period. So if she's Jewish, that blood is impure. If she's not Jewish, there's no difference, as we've discussed in a previous class. So it makes no difference. So what happens if you have a group or a city where there's a mix, there's many Jews and many non-Jews? We don't go by the majority, as we would in other cases. And therefore, if you just found it lying around somewhere, we clearly assume that it came from a non-Jewish woman or girl. And therefore, the status is that it's not impure. Because Jews are really careful to properly, in a very discreet way, to hide and put away um, these stains, and therefore we are certain that it came from an Anjou. Next, speaking about modesty, another area where the non Jews are not modest as Jews are. A non-Jew is not modest when it comes to his uh, doing his needs, to defecating. And when he's traveling, again, this is in the olden days, more so than today, or at least not so much in this part of the world or in the Western society. But when he's traveling on the road, he will defecate, by his animals, just as they do. Unlike a Jew, he'll go off to the side of the road. And some say this is the reason for the ruling that if human urine is found near a urine of an animal that we will burn truma. Truma is um, food which basically is holy. That it was tithed. And we are assuming that this human urine came from a non-Jew because the Jews would not just do it right there where their animals are. Stam goy mar bedvarim. Your average, typical non-Jew, stam goy, will speak a lot, will divulge information. And therefore, when he's a partner in business, he will let everybody know about it. Because again, he's lacking modesty. And he yells, Don't give it for this amount, but rather for that amount. And therefore, Okay, um, he doesn't have to be concerned that people don't know that um, he has a partnership with an Anju, and therefore when it comes again to, let's say, tithing and giving it to the Koyen, to the priest, because the Jew has to give um, annually one-tenth of his animals to the Jew to the cook to the Kayin, to the priest, unless he's a partner with a guy. Here too, we assume that everybody knows and it's public and common knowledge that he's a partner because the guy would make it known. Hadavar <clears throat> Safek. Now we have a doubt as to the following. We're not sure. Why is it that physically speaking, 
the physical body of the Goyim, of the non-Jews, is not as warm like the Jews. So there's two reasons why the Jew's body is physically warmer. One, since the non-Jews don't have this Jewish guilt, they don't have this fear of keeping the commandments properly and not transgressing. There's so many rules for a Jew, all the do's and all the don'ts. So that makes them worried. And the non-Jews don't have that burden on them. And it's out of worry, out of concern that the Jews have, that that actually heats up their body. That's one approach. Oi, or alternatively, or maybe because they eat all sorts of insects, maybe that does heat up their body. And therefore, even though they don't have all of these worries which would heat up their body, but they have other elements that Jews don't have. So what would be the practical difference as to whether we're saying that the body heat of non-Jews is the same as Jews or much less? The difference would be What happens if there's semen that came from a male Jew that is inside the body of a non-Jewish woman? So, does it become um, spoiled and unconceivable after 72 hours, after three days, or not? And therefore, it would make a difference whether it becomes, whether it makes one impure. In other words, in order for semen to be a state of impurity, it has to be, so to say, in a live state, which means it's got to be within 72 hours from the omission. Otherwise, it's no longer, um, doesn't cause any, the person to become impure. So the question is, it's semen of a Jew, but it's in the body of a non-Jewish woman. So if we're going to say that their body heat is not the same, so that's one approach. But if we say that it is the same, so then it would apply as if it was came from a Jewish woman. There is a dispute if it, within the Talmudic sages. Are the Goyim so meticulous and careful about cleanliness and they cover their water, their drinking water, that no foreign particles or anything should fall into it. Are they really careful to cover it? And for that matter, it will be permitted to drink water from a non-Jew. If a non-Jew offers a Jew a bucket or a pitcher or a glass of water, we don't have to say, well, maybe some bugs came into it. No, they're clean and therefore they're careful to keep the cap on or keep it covered. Even though they're not careful about this concept of not allowing water to stay open overnight like Jews are. But it doesn't matter. They're still clean by nature. Or alternatively, no, they're not careful about that. And therefore, the Jews should be concerned that there may be all sorts of unhealthy, forget about non-kosher, unhealthy particles there. Now, for that reason, actually, if you're going to take the approach and say that Stam Goyim are clean and are careful, so some rule that when it comes to the process of koshering meat, in order to get the blood out of the meat after the proper animal was slaughtered properly and ritually by a shoychet, by the slaughterer, so then the meat has to go through a salting process. After it's soaked 
after it's salted, and the idea is that the salt draws out the blood, which is forbidden for a Jew to consume, what's very important then is you have to rinse off the salt properly, because otherwise there's still blood there. Can we trust that the non-Jew properly rinsed off the blood? Or does the Jew have to do it or supervise it? So according to some authorities, we can trust them. Why? Because it's a matter of cleanliness. Not just because of the rules. They're not going to let bloody salt remain on the animal, on the piece of meat, and therefore we can trust that they properly rinsed it off. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I really wanted to finish today. Um, should we go for it or should we stop here? What you're up to? Up to the last piece. No, I mean, what, what are you up to? Which Yourself. Piece? Huh? Yourself. Oh, 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 oh. I think we can do, go for it. Okay. All right. Suffolk Goy. It's the last subsection in this entry of Goy, which many, many pages ago was the beginning. Long time ago. A real long time ago. And now the last part is called Suffolk Goy. What happens if someone is a doubt as to whether they are a non Jew? We don't know. It's a doubt. Let us see. Bishloishaifanim Donim al Suffolk Goy Suffolk Yisro. There are three ways, three approaches that we judge an individual who is in a category of being a doubt as to whether they are a non-Jew or a Jew. And this will have much practical ramifications nowadays as well, of course. Number one. Someone approaches us, we don't know who he is. A human being came over to us. We don't know what to make of him. We should just believe whatever he says. How about if a child was found, an infant, a newborn infant was found in a basket. And in this city there are many Jews and many non-Jews. What do we assume about this baby? And number three, specific lands in the world that Jews got mixed into those lands. And now let's explain. <clears throat> An individual, a human being, came from a city which clearly the majority of that city are non-Jews. They're Goyim. And nobody knows that this person to be a Jew. Some guy came, he was born, and he is a citizen and he was a member of a particular city where most of the people there are non-Jews. And no one knows him to be Jewish. That individual, he now has to produce with proper kosher witnesses that can testify that he's Jewish. In other words, we have to assume that he's not Jewish until proven to be a Jew. Can't just say, my mother told me I'm Jewish. Who are you? Where are you from? You're coming from a city that the majority of the people there are not Jews. Omru, and likewise, the statement in the Talmud is Shabolit el Yisro. If a poor person comes to take charity. In those years where we tithe and we give it to the poor people, right? We give a tenth of the produce in certain years to the poor. The guy comes and he's poor. That's not as hard to prove that he's poor. We don't, you know, suspect that he's got some 
Swiss bank account somewhere. He's poor. Okay. But to fulfill the mitzvah of Meiser Ani, that particular tithe, you can only give it to a Jewish poor person. We don't know the guy's Jewish. He has to prove that he's Jewish in order to have rights to take this produce. And he only needs one witness. In this case, one witness would be sufficient, but he needs one witness. Avil Rishenim Kosvu. However, early codifiers wrote, Shemi Shabalafanenu. And if someone appears before us, Voimer Yisraelani, and he says, I'm Jewish. And we didn't have any assumption that he was a guy. We don't know. The guy just walks in. It's the first time we're meeting him. And his introduction is, I am Jewish. Shema minim loy. We believe him. Because he's not trying to undo a certain status that he has. We don't know him from Adam or from Noah or from Abraham. So he walks in and he says, I'm Jewish. And even in a situation where the place is that the majority of people there are not Jewish, they're a minority. And the logic is as follows. Because at the very least, most people who appear before us, the Jewish community, and claim to be Jewish, are Jewish. That's the fact. So we don't go by the majority of the people in this country or in this city or in this neighborhood right now. Here is a person that we didn't know to be non-Jewish because we don't know him. <clears throat> and he steps out of this mix of people that he had no status. And he says, I'm Jewish. Okay, most people in the Jewish community or in the synagogue or appearing before the based in and say they're Jewish, are Jewish. So therefore, we have to assume he's Jewish. That's one approach. These are events that happen daily. Guests come. We don't start checking into their lineage. We never met the guy before. He comes to town. We drink their wine. We eat from the meat that they slaughter. And wait a second. Who said he's Jewish? We don't ask for credentials when it comes to those things. And furthermore, when it comes to the most important thing, it's one thing to drink their wine and to eat their slaughtered meat. That's, those two things are very important. But there's something which is far more important. Marriage. And we also marry them off, accept them, because they just walk in and they say they're Jewish. These are daily occurrences. And likewise, if somebody comes from a far off land, coming from some far place, and he holds himself as a Jew. He claims to be Jewish. And he behaves like a Jew. We don't start analyzing and questioning and trying to figure out if he's really Jewish. We don't, we don't know anything about him. I mean, the, guy, the guy came from a far off land, claims to be Jewish, behaves like a Jew. He is considered like an absolute Jew. And we don't tell this Jew, prove you're Jewish. Okay? Again, these are daily occurrences that happen, especially in today's world, when we have the whole idea of the Balei Teshuvah, of the returnees, Jews that are coming from backgrounds that, unfortunately, they were brought up in a certain way. They were not observant. And they just show up into a Chabad house and they say, I'm Jewish, my mother's Jewish. And they want to be Jewish. So how much investigating do we need to do? Now, even according to the opinion, there is one opinion that says as follows. 
How about if a, 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 an individual shows up to the Jewish community, to the Jewish based in? We don't know him from anything. Whatever, okay, we don't know to assume anything. And the guy says, I was born a non-Jew. I was a goy. And he says his mother wasn't Jewish. And he says, I converted properly. He could have said I was born Jewish if he wants to lie. He comes along and he tells us the following story. He is a ger, a ger tzedek, a proper convert who became Jewish. And he says, I became Jewish in a basting. So there's an opinion that says that we cannot trust him to allow him to marry a Jewish girl. Only in the land of Israel, but not outside the land of Israel. But even that, it's only because he's admitting that he was, at one point, a non-Jew. But then, it makes no difference whether it's in the land of Israel or outside of the land of Israel. If he claims to always have been a Jew, that he was born from a Jewish woman, then, we, then he's believed. And then there are some of the later codifiers, Shekasva the wrote, Shemishabami Yaratzacheris, that someone who comes from a different land, Voimer Yisrolani, and he says, I'm Jewish. And he doesn't have any family that we can assume. So some say that person has to prove that he's not a, um, a non Jew. Because we don't know him, and he's coming from a different country. So who are your relatives? We don't know anything. We're just relying on his word. So then they say that he has to prove he's not a goy. And even if he's behaving like a Jew, and he speaks our language. The guy speaks a Yiddish. He speaks Hebrew, whatever it is. And he knows all the details, all the Jewish stuff. I mean, he even talks with his hands like this. However, the other codifiers disagree with that approach. And they prove that no, he is believed and he does not need to prove his Judaism. Then we said, what about an infant who's an abandoned infant, a newborn that was found in the city? And the city has many Jews and many non-Jews. So the legal term in the Talmud and in the Shulchan Aruch, the Jewish code of law, for such a child is called an Asufi. And these laws will be found in the encyclopedia here, in the entry called Asufi. Barat says, what about the lands where the ten lost tribes were exiled to? Going all the way back. As the verse states in the book of Kings 2, And the king of Ashur exiled the Jews to the land of Ashur. And he placed them. It lists these geographic um, locations there. So now, it's sort of the reverse. We have a doubt about the non-Jews there that were mixed into the Jews. And now, we have a real problem. You see, what it takes to be Jewish without proper conversion is that the person's mother has to have been born Jewish. And of course, for her to have been Jewish, she had to be born from a Jewish mother, going all the way back to the giving of the Torah three and a half thousand years ago at Sinai. So, so long as that chain was broken and... It doesn't matter what the father was. So if you have an individual whose mother's, 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 mother's father was Jewish, but mother was not, 
she's not Jewish. So it could work in either way. So you can have someone who thinks that they're not Jewish, but actually this huge number of Jews exiled into there one day, and this person happens to be, a maternally speaking, from Jewish descent. Well, then that person's Jewish. Or vice versa, somebody who thinks they're Jewish, but because there's a lot of non-Jews there, and in their maternal line, someone who was not Jewish. So what do you do in those cases? So there's a doubt. So there's actually a dispute between the Talmudic sages. If a non-Jew, someone who's assumed to be a non-Jew in this non-Jewish land, but there's a lot of Jews that exile to there, if he married in a Jewish way a woman, a Jewish woman, nowadays. So Rav Yehuda Omar Rav Asi Choy Shishim L'Kidushov Shema Me'asar Sashvatimu V'Nosu Nochriyos So we have to be concerned. Maybe, we don't know for sure, but we can't dismiss it. We have to think that perhaps he's really a Jew. He's a descendant of the Jews. And therefore, his marriage is binding because maybe he comes from the Ten Lost Tribes in his maternal lineage. Which means she's a married woman now. You can't just say, oh, that's a guy, so it doesn't count. And therefore, she could properly marry any Jew. No. And because they married non-Jews. And therefore, if a Jew had relations with a non-Jewish woman... So that child would be considered an illegitimate child called a mamzer. Mm-hmm. Um, normally, um, the mother is what determines whether the person is Jewish or not. Mm-hmm. Now what happens if you have a Jewish man, like from the Ten Lost Tribes, and had relations with a woman who's absolutely not Jewish? So instead of just saying that, oh, that child's not Jewish because it goes by the mother, there's an opinion that says that because the father is Jewish, that child would be considered a mamzer, an illegitimate Jew. But that's if it's a product of, a, of, a, of something that would be a death penalty. True. Oh, well, there's different opinions. The halacha is that in order for it to be a mamzer, it has to be a capital offense relationship. Correct. Um, but, for example, Rabbi Akiva holds that no, it's it's any forbidden relations would be a mamzer. We don't follow that. We don't rule like that. But then there's also the opinion that if a Jew has relations with a non-Jewish woman, which is not a capital offense, mm-hmm. that child will be a Jewish mamzer or a mamzer. Mm-hmm. And therefore, if a mamzer married a Jewish woman, we're not saying that she's really married to him, but we're not saying that not either. And therefore, we have to be concerned. And therefore, we would demand a divorce document, a bill of divorce called a get. Mm-hmm. Or are we not concerned with that? Or do we say, no, the child goes by the mother. And since the mother is not Jewish, it's totally irrelevant who the father is. And the child is 100% not Jewish. And therefore, we're not concerned. What our concern is, maybe it's from the women of the Ten Lost Tribes. So maybe, in fact, this non-Jewish woman is Jewish. The goy shebal bas Yisrael avat kosher. And if a goy had relations with a non-Jewish woman, that child is not only Jewish, but he's a kosher Jew. He's not even a mamzer. And for that very reason, the Talmudic sage Rabbi Yechanan is concerned that there may be Mamzerus, these may be illegitimate Jews, and the Mamzer is not allowed to marry into the Jewish community. A Mamzer can't marry another Jew, and a Mamzerus can't marry another Jew. I mean, they can only marry each other. 
Why? Because we're saying, really, let's be concerned they might be Jewish because of the paternal of the maternal lineage. And since they weren't careful, so therefore there was all sorts of mess-ups in the marriages, and the person married his own sister or his own daughter, and the product of that, of course, is a mamzer. And even if in those places the majority of the people are clearly goyim, they're non-Jews. The problem is, we have another rule. In these countries where the Ten Lost Tribes ended up, even though they're, let's say, a great minority, or a minority by far, but we have a rule in Jewish law that if something is established, or something is, has a state of permanence, we don't look at the numbers or percentage, but it's considered 50-50. Normally, we say go by the majority. If you have 10 shops that sell meat, one of them sells kosher, nine sell non-kosher, and you found a piece of meat, it's not kosher. Or vice versa. Nine sell kosher, one sells non-kosher, you found a piece of meat, it's kosher. However, if it's kavua, if it is has a state of permanence, then we don't care what the numbers are, it's 50-50. So here too, maybe because there's 10 lost tribes, which that's a fact, they came to these countries. Mm-hmm. The names of the countries are listed in the verse. So therefore, we have to always be concerned that perhaps they're, they're Jewish. And some say, no, this is, not a, this is not a classical case of kavua. This is not where we say that it's permanent. Shaboyal haleich eitzel ha'isha. Because you say, no, no, when it comes to um, relations, you always go by the woman. The only concern is that we're talking about in those places where the majority is the ten lost tribes. But they're getting so intermingled and over the years and over the generations, we don't know if there's a simul- uh, to what degree the assimilation is happening. But there was a point where the majority of the people in these certain countries were the ten lost tribes. So therefore, we can't establish that they lose their Jewish status. And now, a thousand years later, all the people there are suffolk, are doubtfully maybe Jewish. All the goyim there that will swear up and down both parents are non-Jews. What are you talking about? Go back a thousand years and there were all these Jews that came. So maybe they are maternally have a straight line of being Jewish. Shmuel Omar, and the Talmudic sage Shmuel said, We're not concerned that if a non-Jew marries a Jewish woman, Shema Yisrael, we don't have to be concerned, maybe he's Jewish. Either because when those people of the Ten Lost Tribes did in fact um, have relations with non-Jewish women. Okay, so then those children are absolute goyim. If the mother is not Jewish, they're goyim. Ubnoi zeser sashvatim. Hi, what about the women? There's, let's assume 50% of the Ten Lost Tribes were male and 50% are female. So very nice, you're telling me that the Jewish men that intermarried with the local non-Jewish women and had children, those offsprings are absolute goyim. That's nice. That's only half the story. What about all the non? What about all the Jewish women of the ten lost tribes that intermarried with the local non-Jewish men? Kabbalah biyadenu. We have an oral tradition. That they were barren women that had no children. That original first generation of the ten lost tribes. We have this tradition that none of the Jewish women bore children. Didn't happen. So therefore, Shmuel says, no problem. There was a lot of intermarriage, yes. But it was only ones that bore fruit were the Jewish men with the non-Jewish women, and therefore all the Jewish women that married non-Jewish men had no children, so therefore all the descendants of the ten lost tribes that are not really Jewish are goyim. Oi, or another alternative approach is, another opinion is, that what they did, all these first generation, ten lost tribes women, 
where they made themselves extremely unattractive and disgusting so that none of the local um, non-Jews would want them. So again, either way you look at it, there were no Jewish offsprings. Or, a third option is that at that time, because of what was happening, and this is the rabbinic power, this is the, the, the authority and the power that God grants the rabbis of the time, they made a decree and they said that all of the children of these Jewish women of the Ten Lost Tribes, of that first generation, they are Goyim. What do you mean? The mother's Jewish. They made a decree, and they said they're absolute Goyim. Halacha Kishmul, and in fact, the halacha is like Shmuel, for whichever one of these reasons you want to pick, but the halacha is that if in any situation, if a non-Jewish man marries a Jewish woman, we are not at all concerned that maybe he is Jewish, going back, 200 generations? No. She does not need a get. And if she marries a Jewish man and has children, we're not concerned. There's no mamzeris, none of that. Hagoyim Shebetarmud. The goyim that are in a location called Talmud. So there's a dispute in the Talmudical sages as to whether they are considered absolute goyim. And therefore, and you can accept converts to Judaism from them. Or do we say, no, they are doubtful that they might be Jewish. And the reason why we don't accept converts is because if they're Jewish, that means they're, they're, they're probably mamzerim. In other words, in a certain sense, it's much better if we know that so-and-so is an absolute guy, because then they could become Jewish. But if somebody might be a guy and might be a Jew, well, what's the, what's the question? Oh, because of this. Wait, that means that if they're Jewish, they're mamzerim. So that's even worse. And therefore, we don't accept them. So there's a doubt. Bitama Sofik, what's the reason for this doubt? Yeshraimim some say, Shumishum Sha'avde Shloimai Nasubnais Yisrael Vidaru Shambhaz Kas Goyim. King Solomon had thousands upon thousands of servants, non Jewish servants, non Jewish slaves. So many of them married Jewish girls and lived in the land of Eretz Yisrael as Goyim. And there's the opinion that says that if an Eved, a non-Jewish slave, has relations with a Jewish girl, the child is Jewish and is a Mamzer. So that would be problematic. That would be worse than if they're Goyim. And some say that the reason why we have a doubt and we consider them to might be mams, Jewish mamzerim is because the, Jew, the Jewish girls of Jerusalem that were oppressed and tortured by the non-Jews at the time of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And again, the children are Jewish, but they're mamzerim. However, in conclusion, we have this great Talmudic sage who testified in the name of the last official, or one of the last official prophets, Haggai, that he said that we do accept converts from them meaning we don't consider maybe their Jewish mamzerim. Bizman nowadays, ein kviyus l'umay there is no established set permanence for the nations of the world, shekulam nispal because everybody was all mixed up. The whole world is all a big mix. V'chol shepeyresh hayoyim meirubam peyresh, and any individual that 
is separated from all of humanity. Let's say you got some 6 billion people on the planet. Now, the majority of those people are not Jewish, and the majority of those people are able to convert. And therefore, it became a big mix. So halachically, by Jewish law, if you pull out an individual from that mix, we have to go by the majority, and we don't say kavua, we don't say that it's established, therefore it's 50-50. Nope. And therefore, any individual who is assumed to be non-Jewish can convert. We're not concerned. Maybe he is a descendant of Jews, which means he's, he's very likely a mamzer, and that's a problem. No, we don't assume that. Okay, so this last piece has much practical application nowadays. Now, when this encyclopedia was written and first published, this was many years before the whole story with what happened in most recent decades with the Ethiopian Jews, with the Falashas, and all the various different groups. And it became a very, very serious issue, a very serious question. How do you treat these Jews? Um, Russian Jewry, and in the land of Israel, over the last few decades, such a mix. There's people coming from all sorts of countries. Many of them claim to be from the Ten Lost Tribes. Many of them have traditions as to which tribe they're from. And they say, this one says they're from Menashe, this one says they're from Don, Naftali, whatever they're claiming. And they could very well be from those tribes. The problem is, who says they're Jewish? <coughs> and if they're Jewish, who says they're not Mamzerim? So a lot of serious, serious problems in contemporary Jewish law, what to do. Um, First hand, I am in, involved to a certain degree, and I know of an individual who has a very strange story, claims to be Jewish. Go prove it. He wanted to get married, and he went to the Beistin, to the Jewish court, and they started to question him, interrogate him, and how does he prove he's Jewish? It's not so simple. Can't just bring his mother. Can't just bring a, you know, what is he going to do? Bring a picture of her tombstone that has Hebrew. What, what, what does he do? So it's a problem. It's a big problem. And publicly and openly, starting in 1971, the Rebbe Melech HaMoshiach began, publicly I say, because it started much beforehand, an open campaign and an open battle, a war, called Mihu Yehudi, the who is the Jew question, and was demanding that in modern day Israel, the law has to be as it originally was, that it clearly defines what is considered and who is considered a Jew in the land of Israel, only someone whose mother is Jewish or that they converted to Judaism, kahalacha, according to the traditional, proper Jewish law of the code of law. Uh, Because of a story, complicated, very, very painful, very, very detailed and long story, the government had a vote, and they took out, they uh, changed the law, uh, they amended it, and they took out the word kahalacha. The Rebbe Melech HaMashiach spoke about that for countless hours. I shouldn't say spoke. Screamed and yelled in tremendous pain. And he said that when the Israeli government took out the word kahalacha, according to Jewish law, from that law of return, as it's called, Chok HaShvut, the law of return, which gives a person a right uh, to come to the land of Israel if they're Jewish and then they get all these rights. Them removing that is the worst decree ever in Jewish history. And at the time, I think it's fair to say that most everyone did not understand the gravity of the tragedy and the extent and why it was as bad. And decades later, everybody now looks back and realizes that 
that would have saved the situation today. And today the situation is basically beyond repair. And many, many of these Ukrainian, Russian, whatever, Jews that are coming to the land of Israel, a huge percentage of them are absolute goyim. And the damage that has been done, and it's just, it's, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's beyond. And um, there are many, many questions and many, many problems that on a daily basis have to be dealt with and it is very, very complicated um, how to approach and how does a person prove their identity and if they're Jewish. And in some, many cases we say, well, let them go through a conversion just to be strict. That solution doesn't always work because in most recent times, just uh, very recently, the big controversy in the Israeli army they went through mass conversion because a lot of the Israeli soldiers are not Jewish, but the army um, made them go through a conversion or offered them a conversion to become Jewish. It was basically one big joke. They themselves say so, oh, these soldiers, and sometimes it's very easy and very clear to say this conversion is absolutely worthless. It is not worth a piece of paper that they gave them. It's worse than a Mickey Mouse conversion, and it's nothing. But in other cases, it becomes kind of problematic because maybe it is a good conversion. A uh, conversion which is done by anything other than a proper, based in by Jewish law, is absolutely non-conversion. So if it's done by conservative Judaism, by reform Judaism, by reconstructionist Judaism, or by whatever else they're going to make up, it is 100% unacceptable, and the person is a guy as he was beforehand. The problem becomes, if it's done in so-called Orthodox Judaism, but the base Din didn't really do it as is prescribed in the Shulchan Aruch and the Code of Jewish Law, so you can't just dismiss it and say, oh, it's not acceptable because it wasn't orthodox based in. But when you meet the individual or the individuals who they converted and you speak to them, they didn't really know much at all what they're getting into. So what makes it proper? Just because by name it's an organization? Well, so a lot of problems. Um, so with that... We conclude, finally, after many, many weeks of studying the entry of Goy in the Encyclopedia Talmudis, and I encourage, as always, everyone to um, continue studying with the intent of keeping and fulfilling all of the seven mitzvahs b'nei noyach, and all of the um, obligations and rights that go along with it, much, much more than just seven, of course, as we've discussed in many classes, and to all serve God in unison and to fulfill the purpose of the whole creation with the coming of our righteous Mashiach and the final redemption immediately now.